taping? All right, cool. <coughs> there we go. That's the, the, the main kind of editing I like to do <coughs> with the button. <laughs> so anyway, here we go. Dear Jeremy Father, we uh, thank you for this day. I thank you again for these students. Just ask you to bless our work today. Help us to uh, glorify you what we do and just understand a little bit more about uh, power series and series together, Lord. In my prayer, Lord Jesus. Amen. So it occurred to me <clears throat> that I probably should um, take a step back and do some elementary things like define a series, right? So I'm guessing that you guys don't remember the definition of series. Am I right? So um, the sum n equals zero to infinity of let's say um, cn, I usually use a's, I'll find C, cn, which is of course c0 plus c1 plus c2 plus dot 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 dot, right? Um, converges um, to let's say uh, L if and only if um, if the limit as um, let's see here n goes to infinity of the sum j equals zero to n of c sub j uh, converges exists rather equals l. I'll get it eventually. Sorry, so I, I have I have picked like my most unfavorite way of saying this sentence, but what I'm trying to say is that a series is defined by a sequence of partial sums. So the sequence of partial sums is a, is a sequence of complex numbers, and if it converges in the sense of um, <clears throat> a sequence of complex numbers like we talked about before, I did define that, right? Did I define sequential limit in here? I'm not sure if I didn't, so let me just check on that. So we say <coughs> the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to L if for each epsilon greater than zero there exists big N in the natural numbers such that <coughs> um, N greater than uh, N implies the modulus of a sub N minus L is less than epsilon. So that's the definition of a sequential limit, right? Epsilon, del epsilon n definition. So a series exists, <coughs> converges to L, let's say. We usually call L its sum, right? The sum of the series is L in my... <coughs> Forget the L for a second here. Let's put it S. That feels better. S is for sum. There you go. Is that better? So the, the sum of the series is S, and the series converges to S if and only if what? The sequence of partial sums exists and converges to S, all right? This is the definition you should have seen in calculus two. Maybe may, may not have seen it. There's a lot of things to do in calculus two, right? Okay, so <coughs> example one. This is an important example, is this. We can study the sum uh, n equals zero to infinity of like c um, r to the n. So this would be, you know, c um, plus cr plus cr squared plus dot 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 so forth and so on, right? And we can ask the question, when does this series converge, right? So you've almost done this in a homework already, right? So <clears throat> if we look at the, let's, let's use this notation for the, um, for the nth partial sum. Well, that would be what? That would be c plus cr plus cr squared plus da 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 plus cr um, to the n minus 1, right? There's the nth partial sum. What happens if I multiply this by r? If I multiply by r, rsn is what? cr plus cr squared plus da 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 plus c r to the n minus 1 plus c r to the um, c r to the n. So I, I kept 
an additional term at the end so you can see the cancellation better, right? Because if we take these two things, yeah, like so, don't tell the other professors I did this, if we subtract these equations, what do we get? Well, we get 1 minus r parentheses times Sn is equal to, and you see what happens, right? <coughs> you know the story, you know how it goes. This cancels, this cancels, this cancels, this cancels, this cancels. What are we left with? C plus C R to the N, right? <coughs> <coughs> sorry guys. More sorry to the people watching this because that's got to be deafening. Um, anyway, so S N formula is um, C. Oh yeah, thank you. No, no, no. By all means, interject. Thank you. So C minus C R to the N divided by 1 minus R. All right. Now, what's the story? Does this, this is the, so I, as I always emphasize in calculus too, this is precious and rare. This is a stone cold formula for the nth partial sum. These are hard to come by. But here it is. This is a formula for the nth partial sum. What happens as n goes to infinity here? So here, to be clear, I'm letting c and r be complex numbers. This is not calculus 2, right? Complex numbers. This is a complex series. OK, so well, here's the deal. <coughs> Um, here's a little theorem. The limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n equals to zero implies the limit as n goes to infinity of the modulus of b sub n is equal to zero. Um, <coughs> so what does that say? For example, if the, um, if the modulus of r, right, is greater than 1, then what happens to the limit as n goes to infinity of c r to the n over, I mean, we could, let, let's, let me just take away the, uh, what is the point of that? All right, let's see here. <coughs> then the limit of the modulus of r to the n, right, is, by the way, the properties of modulus, modulus, we can pull the n out, right? And then what you got here, this is equal to infinity. All right, what does that mean? That means if the modulus is greater than 1 on this r, the limit of this r to the n piece does not exist, right? And if the limit of the modulus doesn't exist, we would, we would be in trouble if this limit existed, right? So if somehow the limit... <coughs> anyway, I'm not sure my analysis here is totally complete, but long story short, this goes to C. And so you can critique whether or not my argument here is complete. Maybe it's not. Um, C goes to 1 over... This nth partial sum goes to C over 1 minus R, if and only if what? the modulus of r is less than 1. All right? Now in calculus 2, that was absolute value. Right? But here, it's got to be modulus. Yep. Um, I never answered my question. Do you know what the name of this thing is? I hope you do. This is the geometric series, right? The geometric series. So we still have the geometric series in, in complex. Woo! All right, so let me just, without proof, tell you some things. You, you don't want me to prove these things, right? Trust me, you, you don't. Because if I prove them in class, then I might put them on a test. You, know, you, you, you don't want to prove these things, right? Not that they're hard, it's just they're not that interesting. All right? Um, <clears throat> well, this, this, okay, admittedly, this first one would make a nice test question. Um, if <coughs> theorem, <coughs> goodness gracious, if the sum, all right, of Cn exists, 
then um, Cn goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Do you recognize this? Actually, this is the one I can prove because it takes like two seconds. This, my friends, is the nth term test, right? What's the proof of the nth term test? Well, if you take the sum, you know, um, let's say, um, <clears throat> I may use the other notation. Let me look at the nth partial sum. So if I look at like the, uh, the nth, n plus 1th partial sum minus the nth partial sum, what do I get? Let me not like write down everything in the kitchen sink. Let me just tell you the idea of the proof. Ah, it was, it was so close. Um, so what happens when you take the difference of the n plus 1th partial sum and the nth partial sum? What are you left with? Just the, the n plus 1th term, right? So I regret my choices. I'm going to make that n and n minus 1. There we go. What's the difference of the nth partial sum and the n minus 1th partial sum? Uh, yeah, c sub n, right? But to say this exists is to say that the nth par partial sum converges to L, or I, I guess I'm saying S. This also converges to S. S minus S is 0. Therefore, c sub n must go to 0. That one's that would be a, that if I was going to ask you to prove something in this list, this would probably be the nicest one. I even ask Calculus 2 students to prove this sometimes. So that's, I'll put a proof here. <coughs> All right. <coughs> a little bit too much hand waving there to be actual honest to goodness proof here. Next theorem. Um, if... <coughs> Goodness gracious, the sum of the absolute value of Cn um, exists, then this guy exists. Let me put this in words for you. This theorem says this is what's, this is called what? This is called absolute convergence. <laughs> So absolute convergence implies convergence for a series. All right. Let me make sure I'm not butchering that. What's the other theorem about series that I haven't written down? What what if you had the series, you broke it up into its real part and its imaginary part? What do you think, what do you think the theory is? What do, you think, what do you think I could say there? So you have a series, like CN breaks into like the real part plus the imaginary part, yeah? That is true. Yeah, that's true. We have that from the, the, like the vector, our previous theory limits. That's right. So if, if you have a complex series which converges, then the series of real part, the series formed by just taking the real part of every term in, this, in, the, in the series, and the series formed by just taking the imaginary part of each term in the series, those real series separately converge, and they converge to this, the, the, the limit, the, um, the sums of, to which they converge, the complex combination of those is the same value that the complex series converges to. In other words, you can break a complex series up into its real and imaginary parts, consider them separately, and put it back together. There's that theorem. Which is lemma 3.10 in the thing I told you guys you could read if you want. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is, you know, absolute convergence is, it's absolutely convergent if and only if the series um, the corresponding absolute value series converges, all right? There's also a comparison test. The comparison test says if you have the sum over an and the sum over bn uh, complex series, all right, um, with 
Now we just need one of them absolutely convergent with the sum over A and absolutely convergent. All right. Then um, if, here's the next sentence, if the modulus of Bn is less than some positive constant big K times the modulance, mod, modulance, what's modulance? <coughs> I don't know what it is, but it's not what I want. If this is true for some, for some n, you know, n greater than that n, all right? That's written horribly. What I'm saying is there exists a big N such that for little n beyond the big N, we have that estimate, all right? You have that bound. Then what? Then guess what? The sum of the BN is absolutely convergent. And hence convergent. So this is the comparison test, right? Do you guys remember that? But in calculus uh, two, we looked at positive series, right? So you could have Say, said all those things in terms of absolute value, it would have looked more like this if you'd done that. Um, <coughs> a, conservative, a, a, a convergent positive series is an absolutely convergent series, right? Because what's the absolute value of a positive number? Exactly, right back where we started. All right, so that brings us to the next Next result, and this one I'm going to actually spend some class time to prove. <coughs> Hopefully not too much. But this is the ratio test. So if you remember, once the dust settles in calculus 2, the, really the, the test, you know, the most important test really is probably the ratio test, right? I mean, this governs the lion's share of like your intervals of convergence in calculus too, if you think back to it. It did most of the heavy lifting for most of the examples. Yeah. Is K just a scalar there? Oh yeah, K is a <coughs> some in in K is a real positive constant. And whenever I write something's greater than zero or less than zero in this course, it should be understood I must be talking about a real number, right? Because complex numbers are not ordered, so yeah. So one way for me to like just if you if you write in the middle of your proof like a complex number is less than zero or something, it makes me like very suspicious of everything else you write. Like it just it 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 it's not good. It's like guilt by association. No, it's kind of like having a friend that's a Nazi or something. It, Get you into trouble. But we don't have that problem, right? No? No? Right? <laughs> okay. We're not in Illinois. Let's see here. Is that too obscure a reference? Um, let's see here. Ratio test. So <clears throat> let the sum of a sub n. I'm converting all his r's to n's because I don't like to use r for an index. It's weird. Let a sub n be a complex series. All right. And I am on page 66 of the Stuart and Towell book that I mentioned in the announcement, right? Um, and there's a typo here, <laughs> like a pretty big typo. Um, complex series with non-zero terms, all right? such that the limit n goes to infinity of the modulus of a sub n divided by the modulus of, now here's the, in the book he's got a sub n minus 1, but the minus 1 has escaped the subscript and it's living large and incorrectly. <laughs> so like, if you, you no, know, that is definitely not a minus 1. There's no like super special like weird ratio test in complex where you subtract one like that. That's not, that's just a typo. It's easily understood if you've done much teching. There it is. And this is equal to lambda. 
<coughs> then here's the deal. If, <coughs> goodness gracious, lambda is less than 1, then the series a sub n is absolutely convergent. All right. And if lambda is greater than 1, then the series is divergent. What does it mean to say the series is divergent? I guess I didn't say that yet, but you should understand it's not convergent. Right. I'm always scared to say things don't exist when we're talking about them. But, but yeah, the, we, we, we do say that, but it, it does kind of leave a kind of unsettled feeling if you stop and think about it for a second. How is it that we're talking about having meaningful conversations about these things that don't exist? How exactly did that happen? Seems like an odd construct. Yeah. <coughs> the converse of this theorem <coughs> No. Certainly not. <clears throat> not true in the real case, not true here. If the limit of the term, th the nth term goes to zero, that does not suffice to guarantee convergence. Because we can still think about the p equals one series from calculus two. That is a complex series of a very boring real type, but it's still there, yeah. So all of your favorite examples from calculus two that we, I know you guys have been itching to get back to the theory of convergence and divergence from calculus two, right? No? Yeah, not really. I didn't mind the power series. It didn't. I like them better than Oh, well, let's get back to the power series. We're, we're working on it. Um, so, <coughs> they also have a sentence. If lambda equals one, it can go either way. I feel no need to add that to this theorem. Like, I'm sorry, like, I don't, I don't care. This is where the theorem has something to say. So, I'll leave it at that. So, <coughs> the proof is really quite beautiful. And it's just this. For lambda less than 1, we can let rho equal to 1 half lambda plus 1 over 2. All right. Then by construction, you have lambda is less than rho is less than 1. So in other words, rho is just a number we have constructed we just constructed, we constructed a number between 1 and lambda. We can do this by just taking the average of 1 and lambda. That's what rho is. It's simply the average of 1 and lambda. Of course, that's between 1 and lambda, right? This should not be mysterious. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and there exists n in the natural numbers such that what? Such that the, um, the ratio of the modulus a sub n divided by the modulus of a sub n minus 1 is less than rho for <coughs> um, n greater than big N. I guess that, can you guys maybe help me out here? How do we, why does this follow. If you have this limit, why do you have to have that bound for n sufficiently large? Is that a reasonable jump? I think it's a reasonable jump. Think about the contradiction, right? What if this, was, what if this wasn't the case? Right? <laughs> what if you couldn't find an n such that this is smaller than rho? What would that say about this limit? <laughs> yeah, it would imply that lambda's. <coughs> it would imply the limit's greater than lambda for sure, by comparison. Right. Now you can make this precise by going through the epsilonics of the of the limit if you want. All right, that that can be made precise by delving more deeply into the epsilonics of the definition. I don't want to do that. I just, if that's okay with you guys, I'm just going to make this, that's a small jump, but there it is. Now once you have that, what does that say? <coughs> that says for n greater than n, we have the uh, modulus of a sub n is less than 
the um, row, <coughs> ah, times the modulus of a sub n minus 1, which I think I've probably written in the opposite way I want to. Right? Yeah. Well. What? Hmm. Okay. Sorry, it's weird, weirding me out. So if I apply that again, I get rho squared modulus of a sub n minus 2. And I just keep doing that. Rho to the um, n minus n um, a sub big N. <clears throat> now the big N is fixed here, isn't it? Right? So what, is this, what does this tell us? He says, he says then the sum over a sub n converges by comparison with this guy, sum over rho to the r. I'm sorry, that's to the n. I, I every so often drift back into his r, my bad. So that right there, <coughs> for some real So it's a real row with less than one, right? So by the ordinary geometric series from calculus two, we know that converges, right? So <clears throat> I think you can just about see it from this inequality. Um, see, if we look at the sum over, over you know, over, sum over, let's say, sum n, equ n, n equals r, not r, my bad, sum n equals big N, all right, to infinity of like the absolute value of a sub n, my modulus of a sub n, that's less than, you know, this guy. That's a, that's a constant independent of the little n. The sum um, n equals big N to infinity of like rho um, n minus n. <coughs> and again, I can take, I can just write that as little rho to the n. And so what that shows you is that the tail of this complex series is bounded by this convergent series, which then implies that this is convergent. Hence, the complex series is absolutely convergent, therefore convergent. And that gives you the, the ratio test. You could drive a, uh, you know, what? A side-by-side, -side, like through the holes in my proof just now, but you get the, the spirit of it, yeah? <coughs> a dune buggy? Golf cart? Tesla? How do I speak to you guys? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. How do you drive an Elon Musk? A waffle. A waffle. And an iron. And an iron. Sounds violent. Let's see here. Um, <clears throat> All right, where was I? Okay, so we have ratio test. Yeah. Now, <coughs> there's another important, probably even more important theorem, conceptually super important, and I think I'm going to give it a name. Um, let's see here. Let me get rid of all this mess over here. We don't need this stuff anymore. <coughs> all right. So this is, I'm going to call this the um, theorem. I'm going to give it a name. Insides converge, um, outsides diverge. I mean, I, maybe we can come up with a better name for it, but something like that. And, and what I mean by that is just this. Number one, um, <clears throat> if you have this series, uh, a sub n, z to the power n, um, if this converges for z equals to z1 not equals to 0, then by golly, it converges absolutely um, for all z 
with um, the norm of z, the norm, listen to me, the modulus of z less than the modulus of z1. So if you have one point of convergence at a distance modulus of z1 away from your center, which in this case is zero, it all must absolutely converge within that. All right? That's, that's the inside part. The outside part, on the flip side, if you have this series, power series, right, diverges for some, you know, z1, z equals to z1, not equal to zero, then it diverges for all z with the modulus of z greater than z1. Notice in both cases of this theorem, the theorem is necessarily silent about other points of equal moduli. So if I have one point of convergence on the, on the disk of convergence, like on the, on the circle of convergence, I don't get to say anything about the other points on the circle. There are exotic examples where there is just one point of convergence. There are other examples where every point is, a, is, is, in the, is, in the, is in the in the convergence set for the power series. There are other examples where you have accountably dense, you have like just, there are just so many different things possible for the, for the set of points which are convergent on the disk. Of con it's truly rich, there's, there's all kinds of things that can happen. Okay, now, <coughs> the proof I think I'm going to skip the proof. The proof is written um, on page 66. And if I feel especially guilty about it, I'll circle back to it next class. But if you guys don't mind, do you guys don't mind if I skip the proof of this? Nobody? All right. All right. You guys are like, I'm not playing poker with you guys. But mostly because I don't know how to play poker. So, you know. <laughs> I'm hoping to play a game of Risk with my like pastor who happens to be your age. He's pretty good at risk. But I got a secret weapon, which is my six-year-old. We have a pact. We have a pact to defeat Zach. He will fall. He will fall. No. Not even remotely. So, um, a definition, once you have this theorem, and the proof of this theorem, like what I'm skipping over, it is literally just like comparison test. It's very simple. It's not a complicated proof, okay? Um, <clears throat> you just got to know when to fight your battles. And I, my battle is to move on here. So definition, we let R equal to the supremum. Do you guys know what the supremum is? Sup! Modulus of Z such that there exists Z in the complex plane um, such that and here is another most unfortunate I believe typo the series sum he's just got there's no summation here he did this a couple places in this section it's annoying um, a n z to the power n um, converges so This is, so the supremum is, is what, do you guys, you, you real analysis people here, you tell me in words what the supremum is. Also known as the what? Least upper bound. Least upper bound, so. Least upper bound. So you, you look at all possible points where you have convergence of the series Right? And you pick well, you pick the largest you pick the largest one if it's attained, right? But it could be that the circle of convergence doesn't actually have any point on it where you actually converge, right? So it can't pick the point, but you can get arbitrarily close to that. Well, this is what the supremum does, is it, it, it picks it for you. For example, the geometric series. Right? What example am I on? Three? Is there even an example yet? I don't know. Is this one? Maybe it's one. 
So if I have, you know, f of z equals to the sum n equals one, uh, listen to me, one, zero, zero to infinity of z to the n, all right, that is a geometric series. This is literally equal to 1 over 1 minus z for what z? Mm. Modulus of z less than 1. Are there any points on the unit circle which the geometric series is cool with? No, they're all dead to it. So this is a place where the supremum is doing its job because you can't get any point with modulus of z equals to 1 where the series converges. But this supremum would give you back 1 for the radius of convergence. That's because if you look at all the possible upper bounds, like the least upper bound is <coughs> 1. All right, now, <clears throat> so you might, I mean, I think a natural question to ask, right? You guys, some of you are engineers, right? Is what, is, a, is there a formula for R? Is there a formula for R? Do you know? So there is a formula for R. So let's say discussion. If we have the, let's say, a sub n divided by the absolute value of uh, modulus of a sub n minus 1, right? Um, and suppose that this, you know, the limit of this as n goes to infinity, right? Suppose that that's equal to L, all right? Then what does that tell us? That tells us also that the limit as n goes to infinity of what? The modulus of a sub n times z to the n divided by the modulus of a to the n minus 1, z to the n minus 1 equals to what? In other words, that implication, like you guys tell me the algebra step I got to make there, multiply by what? How would, how would the modulus of z to the n and the modulus of z to the n minus 1 simplify? Use your imagination. It's just actually, if you canceled it out, it's nothing more than modulus of z, right? Because you've got one more upstairs than downstairs, and the mod modulus of the product is the product of the moduli. You guys proved it in the homework, not me. It's your fault. So look, that is equal to L times modulus of z, right? So ratio test says what? This converges what? This is equal to lambda, right? We need that to be less than 1 for convergence, absolute convergence, yeah? So apparently, we need what? We need the modulus of z less than 1 over L. Aha! There you go. Radius. So in other words, we, we have a formula for the radius. It's simply the limit as n goes to infinity. Flip the script over there, a sub n minus 1 over a sub n, or if you like, you could put a plus 1 downstairs rather than like the n minus 1, whatever. Flip it. There you go. There's a formula for the radius of convergence. What do you guys think of that? Easy formula, Easy formula right. Which is why it took a while for this theorem to be found. The radius of convergence um, of the series a n z to the n is given by 1 over r is equal to this, the limit supremum limps up of the modulus of a sub n to the 1 over n power. And that's a real quantity, so we're not talking about any of the nefarious nth roots that you guys have grown to love in the homework, of course. Right? There it is. Now this, my friends, is known as the Cauchy-Hadamard Cauchy theorem. 
And that is the grown-up way of finding the radius of convergence. Because you see, there's a problem with my argument. What is it? What, what's, what's the problem with the ratio test? Why is the root test in some sense better than the ratio test? Do you remember? One thing we haven't gotten away from in complex numbers, still a problem, division by zero, right? So if your series has zeros and it's, you know, if it's got terms which are zero, oof, <coughs> this is hard to calculate. Now, there are like modifications of this for maybe you've got a series that's got like all even terms or all odd terms. Like you could soup this thing up to do like just even ones or just odd ones appropriately, right? But this right here addresses the problem of infinitely many zeros in the terms in your series in one foul swoop through the magic of the limit superior. Now, I don't expect you guys to like use this even or do much with it. I mean, I might have a homework problem on it later. <clears throat> I don't think I'm, I don't even, I don't even, I don't plan to even have a problem on the quiz on this, okay? I just want you to know about it. This was known to Cauchy in like 1820-ish. Hadamard published this in 1888. <coughs> All right, so that, it was that kind of under the radar. Um, <coughs> so anyway, I would say it's a kind of, it's a, it's a delicate theorem. I mean, calculation of the one over nth root of things that are going to, it's, it's just, it's, the, if you look in the, the, the book that I, you know, <coughs> shared with you for free, um, <coughs> you'll notice they have examples of the uh, cauchy hadamard theorem on page 68. They show you how that calculation goes for like three examples if you want to see, okay? Um, but I, I don't plan to test on this. Ratio test? Sure, I might test on that, right? But All right, so that's it. For now, that's it. That's our theory of convergence. Um, last time I proved the hard thing, that like the term-by-term -term derivative of a power series is <coughs> just what you learned in calculus too. You can differentiate term-by-term, -term and that's the derivative. And, you know, while we're at it, we could... Um, we could level up our game. We should start talking about integrals a little bit, right? What, what should I mean by... So this is going to be important for like the next half hour or so of class. How do you guys... Th what, what should I mean by this? Definition. The integral of f of z dz equals to big F of z plus a constant means what? What does this notation mean for us? Yes? Ah. Oh, no, 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 no. You're thinking too hard. It simply means that df dz is equal to little f. In other words, we can talk about antiderivatives. Now, for reasons that I don't begin to understand, some people call these primitives, like f, big F of z is a primitive of little f. But if you'd like, we could just call it an integral, <laughs> right? An indefinite integral. We can talk about indefinite integral in the complex sense in this way. All right? And um, <clears throat> so example two, <clears throat> excuse me, check this out. So I'll start out with something that's, I, I'll start, I'm going to start out with something that has nothing to do with, with my definition right above at all, okay? But just to get us started, because I think this is interesting, I want to make sure I talk about it. What if you have the function 1 over 1 plus z squared? Can you find me the power series for this? What I would like to test you guys on, series-wise on the test, if anything, is the part of the complex series which is the same tool set that you already should have seen in Calc 2. All right, so that's what I'm going to try to focus on the rest of class. So in Calculus 2, I teach people, aha, this is geometric. With, in my notations, did I do A or C? I can't remember. A, A equals to 1 and R equals 2, what? Minus z squared, yeah? So by the geometric series, 
This is straight up equal to the sum, um, n equals zero to infinity, of minus z squared to the power n. Bam. And this is true for when? If the modulus of minus z squared is less than one. So this is what? This is actually the sum, n equals zero to infinity, of what? Minus one to the n, z to the two n. There you go. That is the power series for this function centered at the origin. And what, where is this? For what? For the modulus of z less than one, right? That's how this cleans up, yeah? Have you ever stopped to think about how weird this is? From a, from a real perspective, this is a very, really, really, really weird example because if you just think about f of x, equals to 1 over 1 plus x squared, right? For what real x is this function defined? Does this ever break down for real x? It doesn't, right? The domain of this is everywhere. It's smooth. It's a smooth function on the whole real line. And yet, when we find the geometric series for it, it only works for modulus of x, excuse me, absolute value of x less than 1. Why is that? Well, see, if we're in the complex complex plane, we can understand why that is. What the, what the problem is, is that this function behaves badly. Where? At plus and minus i. So you see the problem is, if we center the power series at zero, we're up against i and minus i. And from a complex perspective, those cannot be ignored. And guess what? From a real perspective, you can try to ignore complex numbers all you want, but you know what? They're there, and they say things about your real analysis, whether you like it or not. <coughs> and they explain things that would otherwise be completely mysterious. See, that's the reason. It's because in the complex case, plus or minus one in the imaginary direction, you, your formula blows up. And as a general principle, the power series only works as far away from its center as the next bad thing in the formula. That's just a general calculational principle. And so the first order of business is we can apply geometric series to do things like this, right? Do you guys remember integration and differentiation of, in, of geometric series? Do you guys remember that? No? Yes? Maybe so? How about this one? Example three, if I have f of z is, let's say, log of one plus z, right? <clears throat> what happens if I differentiate it? I get df dz is one over one plus z. Aha, but that is geometric. So this <laughs> is the sum n equals zero to infinity, minus one to the n, z to the n. Now that's not, I'm trying to find the power series for the original function, right? So what did I do? I just, I differentiated, I found the power series, now what do I have to do to get back? Integrate, right, so I integrate, and I get that the log of one plus z is equal to some constant, remember there's a constant here, plus and while I haven't written the theorem down formally, you guys can figure out what this should be, right? 1 over n, minus 1 to the n over n plus 1, z to the n plus 1. So we have the term by term, term by term integration rule, which is essentially a corollary to the term by term differentiation rule I almost proved last class. Although if you look carefully at what I did, I used an exchange of limits theorem, which we have not proved, which is kind of a deeper theorem of real analysis. More on that later. But <coughs> there it is. What is C? What do we do? How about, what do we know? How about, how about zero? What happens when we plug in zero? What's log of one plus zero? What's the principal log of one plus zero? Guess what? It's zero. Yeah, this is zero. And that's equal to C. Because everything in here has a Z in it. So when you plug in Z equal to zero, that just drops out. So in short, <coughs> we have found that the power series for log of 1 plus z centered at 0 is 
lo and behold, this. Now, if you, 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 maybe you recognize these calculations, maybe you don't. These are exactly the calculations I saw in, show in Calculus 2. All of the Calculus 2 power series stuff comes through here just the same. What else did we learn in Calculus 2? So do, I, I'm, do you guys know what I did here? I mean, I can try to unpack it for you if that didn't, if that slipped past you. All right. <coughs> now you can play other games, right? Like if you had one over one plus z squared, you could integrate not once, but twice to get, wait a minute. Well, I think I've done enough of these. Let me, let me go on here. I don't want to, I want to have more time for what remains. So let me, let me go on here. I think that's enough of this. If you want me to show you more of that, I have oodles of it. I can I have calculus two videos out the wazoo that this just this calculation over and over and over again. You had to change the x's to z's, but it's the same calculation, right? Um, <clears throat> so it's time for us to fess up and be honest, um, honest definitions. <laughs> so here's the honest definitions of, well, all of our favorite elementary functions, right? So what is the actual definition of e to the z? Well, e to the z is in fact the sum n equals zero to infinity, one over n factorial z to the n. That is the, you could take that as the primary definition of the uh, complex exponential. What is the definition of Cosh? It's the sum, um, let's say j equals zero to infinity of one over two j factorial times z to the two j. And cinch z is the sum, let's say j equals zero to infinity of one over two j plus one factorial, factorial, times z to the power 2j plus 1. Here's some low-hanging fruit. Well, this is a theorem I won't prove for you, but a series which is absolutely convergent, all right, which, by the way, the exponential is absolutely convergent everywhere because if you try the ratio test on this, you get zero which means that lambda is definitely less than one, independent of z, which goes to show you that the exponential, the complex exponential is an entire function. It is everywhere convergent to its powers. Like this power series converges everywhere. So that defines a function on the complex plane. And it's absolutely convergent, which means that when you have an absolutely convergent sum, one of the things you can do is you can rearrange the terms any which way. You can parse the sum into different parts. If you have a partition of the integers, you can partition the sum corresponding to the partition. One of my favorite partitions of the integers are even and odds. So if you take the sum of the exponential and you just break it into the evens plus the odds, what do you have? You've got exactly this and that, which immediately proves that this is equal to cosh of z plus cinch of z. This is logically equivalent to saying that cosh z is one half e to the z plus e to the minus c, e, and that cinch z is one half e to the z minus e to the minus c. E. That's just the standard trick that any function with a, with a domain which is symmetric about the origin can be, can be like written as a linear combination of an even function and an odd function. And, but anyway, <coughs> then what? Well, we've also got cosine. Cosine of z, same formula, but what's the difference? we do minus one to the power j over two j. And for you electrical engineers in here, my apologies, but j is, j is an index. It is not square to minus one, despite what you've been told. Let's see here. 
And you might wonder, what have we, why have we been working with all these, all these formulas with current this semester? It's really weird, right? Um, <laughs> sorry. So for those of you who are outside of electrical engineering, they use J for I in there. And we also put J before the coefficient. Oh, J before the coefficient? Yeah. So that's, uh, uh, oh. Well, that's, yeah, I, I go either. I mean, sometimes I, I, I can't make up my mind sometimes on that. I like to put it on both sides. I guess that must be the uh, residual electrical engineering in my, uh, in my brain. I was in electrical engineering for like a semester. I do have a two-year degree in electronics engineering technology, so I know lots about op-amps. <coughs> um, I wonder if that's even relevant anymore. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So um, <coughs> these are the definitions of these functions. If you ask somebody who knows more, they would say this defines. Because these are, every one of these series, you can prove converges on the whole complex plane by the ratio test. The lambda works out to zero. All right? Number two, <clears throat> we have the derivative term by term test, right? It's a very simple exercise to see that the derivative of cinch is cosh, the derivative of cosh is cinch, the derivative of sine is cosine, the derivative of cosine is minus sine. These things can all be derived by term by term calculus. All right. If you look in the book that I, you know, I gave you guys for free, I mean, somebody else has it posted. It's not my fault. Somebody else, if, if other people do it, it makes it right, right? Um, so it's like the third chapter in Hezekiah, I think. But um, <clears throat> anyway. He actually has the calculation from power series that e to the z times e to the w is equal to e to the z plus w. See, there's a theorem that you can multiply power series that are absolutely convergent. These are. And when you multiply power series absolutely convergent, you just collect like terms through something called the Cauchy product. And then you just use the binomial theorem at the level of the calculation and it like just does this. This is a, this, this, it's, it's in, the, in the thing I gave you guys to read. And, and um, I almost always calculate this in calculus too, where I have infinitely more time than here. But it takes me about 15 minutes to do it carefully. I wouldn't try to hurry it here. So any, any questions? So you know you should know these. Now let's try something. Let's Try like one of your homework problems, I mean quiz problems. Um, I think, I'm hoping this is an interesting problem, is to try to derive our previous definition for one of these functions from the power series definition. Let's see if we can do it. I'm not sure how hard that problem is. <clears throat> I may regret this. See how much time I have to regret. Okay, we have to four, right? No, it's too soon. Too soon. Okay, so that's, that, that brings up a larger question is, so for the quiz, I haven't finalized it. I'm, I've got a pretty close to final version of it. There's two ways I can go down here. I can give you a longer quiz, which has more easy problems that are like review for the test. Or I can give you a shorter quiz with just the new stuff. What's your preference? The one that most accurately reflects the test. The one that most accurately reflects the test, all right. Yeah, so, and by the way, I would um, maybe share with you an old test, but I don't think they're terribly relevant. The trouble is, for me guys, is that when I've taught this class before, I have put the integral in test one. I didn't do that for you guys. Um, so we've just, I've just got derivative on test one. So it's a little bit of a different animal, which is why I have a little bit more time for like studying these annoying inverse functions and such. <coughs> so, all right, so let's, let's try something. Which, let, let's try, uh, I think the exponential is most likely to be the, the most unannoying one. So um, let me s let's see if we can think through this. So we have e to the z is the sum and I, I admit before I do this that this may not even make sense, but we're going to try it, okay? <clears throat> 